Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this special discussion focused on the war in Ukraine, which is being felt all over the world, but especially for Ukrainian Americans here in New York City, which is home to the largest Ukrainian community in the nation. My name is Charmaine Luglo, and I would like to introduce our speakers and moderator for its personal reflections on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Our first speaker tonight will be Dr. I'm sorry, Mikhail Dikal is acting chair of the Department of English and director of the Rifkin Center for Humanities and the Arts. Dr. Dikal teaches at the CUNY Graduate Center and the City College of New York, where she's a distinguished professor of English, the 2021-2022 Stuart Katz Professor of Humanities. In her book, In the East, she followed the footsteps of Holocaust refugees who were deported to Soviet sorry, gulags, traveling and researching across the former USSR. She will speak on how the ghost and aftermath of World War II are re-emerging in the current war. Our next speaker is Dr. Renata K. Miller. Dr. Miller is also professor of English and interim dean of humanities and arts at City College of New York. Her most recent book is the Victorian actress in the novel and on stage published in 2019. Renata grew up in a Ukrainian diaspora community in the borough of Queens, and she has been monitoring the effects of the Russian invasion on her cousins in Ukraine. Next speaker is Dr. Lev Servadov, director of Macaulay Honors College at Hunter. Dr. Servadov has served as the director of Macaulay Honors College at Hunter College since 2014. He is an assistant professor of chemistry at Hunter and has been part of the CUNY's Energy Institute. Prior to that, he was senior research associate at the University of Oxford. Moderating tonight will be Dr. Vanessa K. Valdez. Dr. Vanessa Valdez is the interim dean of Macaulay Arts College. She's the former director of the Black Studies Program at the City College of New York, a graduate of Yale and Vanderbilt, and a professor of Spanish and Portuguese. Her research interests focus on the cultural production of Black peoples throughout the Americas, the United States, and Latin America, including Brazil and the Caribbean. I would like to welcome them all now. Thank you, Charmaine, for that. I want to first thank my team at Macaulay Honors College because everyone on this Zoom knows that we pulled this together very, very fast given changing events on the ground, um, given that a war started last week. Um, and so I wanna thank Charmaine, I wanna thank uh, Catherine Leinberger, I wanna thank Julie Verone, I wanna thank Michael Perescondola in particular. Um, and I wanna thank my colleagues, um, two of whom are at City College and one while he is at Hunter is a City College alum. So thank you participants this evening, um, or late evening anyway, or early evening, late afternoon. So I wanna start with the, the name of this event. It's personal, uh, Reflections on the Russian Invasion of Ukraine. How is it personal? What is your relationship to what is happening over there? Michal, I think you're first. Uh, um, okay, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be among friends and colleagues. And um, I should say that um, Professor Sviridov um, was a, my a student in the first class I ever taught at City College. Um, so I'm so proud to, to be with him on this panel. Um, um, so how is this personal? As I, as I, I wrote in, um, in the short bio that Charmin read, I wrote a book that followed Holocaust refugees who basically escaped Nazi-occupied Poland into the Soviet Union and were then, then deported into gulags. And among these refugees, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of approximately quarter million people, was my father. My father's family was a Polish Jewish family that, that escaped into the Soviet Union, were deported to a gulag, which is um, basically a forced labor camp in Arkhangelsk in northern, in the nor in northern Russia. 
Um, and basically my grandparents survived the war in the Soviet Union. My father and my aunt who were children were, were evacuated out of the Soviet Union. But I, so I both researched in archives there um, and I traveled there. Um, and I traveled basically to these areas where people were exiled. Um, and, and so this is a personal story and also part of my, my research project. Uh, and, and, and I can speak maybe later about you know, what I, my thoughts are, uh, but for now, you know, we'll leave it here. Thank you. Renata. First, I want to thank you, Vanessa, for bringing us together today. Um, and even though it's on short notice, uh, Vanessa is someone who shows up. I just want to share for the audience. Vanessa is someone who has always shown up when asked, even on short notice. And so I'm very happy to have this opportunity to return the favor um, and to be here at Macaulay today. So how is this personal? Um, I, as, I, as, as Charmaine mentioned in my bio, um, I am a child of the Ukrainian or grandchild of the Ukrainian diaspora, more accurately. Um, I feel a really strong pull of kinship as I watch what's going on in Ukraine right now. I have family members there, cousins. Um, and so I feel the pull of an identity forged on remembered childhood experiences, uh, the pierogies and stuffed cabbage my grandmother used to put in our refrigerator um, to stock our refrigerator for my working mom the Ukrainian liturgical songs I sang in a church choir, um, mostly through transliterate, knowing, like kind of memorizing transliteration, but I still have the melodies and the words in my head, even if I don't completely speak the language. Um, the periodic hunt for red boots, which were required for the youth folk dancing troupe that I performed in. Um, so I feel like my experiences as someone who grew up in a Ukrainian community are very much coming back to me right now. And part of that feeling of kinship actually is also um, based on a kind of sense of what if thinking. Um, what if my grandmother hadn't decided at age 16 to emigrate from the tiny agrarian village where she didn't go to school because she needs to watch the cows to the United States? What if she hadn't been smuggled illegally across the Detroit River at midnight um, from uh, Ontario to the United States? Um, what if Catholic charities had not intervened and succeeded in preventing her from being deported after she was already raising her two young daughters in the in New York? Um, and if any of these, you know, all these what ifs, um, if if things had not aligned the way they did, um, I imagine that I would have been that I would be in Ukraine right now um, with my cousins. Um, most of them are in Western Ukraine, but two of them are actually fighting in Kiev as we speak. Um, and I'll add that that what if thinking is complicated for me because I converted to reform Judaism 12 years ago. Um, I'm raising two kids who are Jewish and uh, it's complicated because kind of what one's, what my life would have looked like or what, what, what any life look, would have looked like um, from a Jewish perspective is very different from what my what if thinking looks like. In other words, my, my husband's family actually comes from the same region in Ukraine that my family came from, Ternopil Oblast. And for his family, people who lived through the, my family emigrated in the 1920s, but for his family, um, people who were there through the 1930s ended up being victims of genocide and did not survive the Holocaust. Um, so my identity as a Ukrainian is fairly complicated, kind of the identity I was born into and the identity that I have chosen. But in this moment, as I watch what's happening on the news, um, I, I, have, I feel a deep sense of tragedy as I watch what's developing. And that's shaped by the fact that um, I've seen how my relatives have developed over the course of my, how Ukraine is a country and my relatives as citizens of that country have developed over the past 40-ish years, um, 40 plus years, um, from when my grandmother used to go, used to travel there when it was Soviet Ukraine, to, um, you know, throughout, you know, both when they were Soviet, through to when they were, uh, to, to when they were free, um, they still lived in real I would say destitution, and they were, um, you know, we used to send our hand-me-down clothing to them, both when it was Soviet and when they were, and once they were free, um, and then seeing just how that developed over the course of the last, um, 
you know, again, last couple of decades, uh, Ukraine became free in 1991. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a moment and share some photos. Ukraine became free in 90. So these are actually my grandparents. My, my Ukraine. My, can you can everyone see that? Can you see that, Vanessa? Give me a thumbs up. Thank you. <laughs> That's my Ukrainian grandmother on the right, the grandfather I never knew, and their elder daughter. Um, so those, so that's my that's my Ukrainian side of my family. Um, but then in what I recall, sorry, this is a, a, an embroidered pillow, which I have a story about. Well, one of the things that we used to do as a reflection of how my relatives' lives have developed and how Ukraine has developed. My grandmother used to travel to Ukraine regularly, and we used to ship not only our hand-me-down clothing, but we used to go shopping on the Lower East Side to buy um, this red embroidery thread. That was that, that our relatives would use because in the Ukraine they could not get color fast embroidery thread. So we would buy them the raw materials and we would get the pillows back when my, when my grandmother came home. Um, and then um, this is actually what the Ukraine, what my U Ukrainian relatives town and home looked like in 1997 when I visited there. Um, and when I talk about how primitive it was and the kind of court trajectory of development that I've seen, this is, yes, this is the outhouse in my family's, in my family's guard or on my family's farm. Um, so they still had an outhouse in 1997. Uh, so it's six years after Ukrainian independence. Um, the village that my grandparents grew up in is what you know was still had dirt roads, um, still used animal power to get around and for transportation. Um, this is a fairly significant avenue in the small town that my grandparents grew up in and emigrated from. Um, and then this is the these are my relatives uh, the year that I visited them. So this is that's me in the center. Um, but then seeing how they've they had developed. I'm going to stop sharing now. But seeing how they've developed over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, um, you know, in the in the 2000s and 2000 teens, um, from really, as I said, real kind of destitution and struggle to being very Western. And there was a point several years ago when, as we were packing, as I was packing hand-me-downs for my kids to send over to our relatives that my mother said, why are we sending them this clothing? I think, you know, look at them on Facebook. I think they're better off than we are because we were seeing all the images, the vacations that they're taking and restaurant for meals and, um, and you know, kind of the sort of glossy lifestyle posts that we see on social media here. Um, and so for me, just seeing, experiencing and witnessing the progression of Ukraine as a society and the particular progression of my own relations over the course of decades and feeling or and seeing that um seeing that so brutally quashed over the course of the last week um is something that i take very much to heart so i think that's the that's my answer to how it's personal thank you renata thank you michael and renata because i feel like we have a very um robust conversation about history lev you bring us into this moment uh well first of all, and foremost thank you for having me and uh I think there's added pressure with Professor Deckel here. Uh, <laughs> did not disappoint from all the speech 100 class. Um, but uh, again, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, Renata, thank you for sharing those pictures. Uh, for me, it's not only personal, but uh, uh, Kherson is a very is a place very near and dear to my heart. That unfortunately, as of last night, has an additional distinction of being the first major city to have fallen into the hands of the uh, Russian invasion uh, forces. Uh, it is a region that my family helped first settle uh, when Catherine the Great and Potemkin uh, decided to develop that part of Russia. We were a part of uh, a group of German Jews who were brought over along with Germans to develop the Russian Southern Fleet, uh, the Russian Southern Command, and we were tasked with developing agriculture, uh, which is something that we did um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, Kherson is a city that is a quite a sophisticated city, despite its small size. It used to be said that all the polite people and intellectuals came from Kherson, and all the troublemakers ended up in Odessa, which naturally meant that Odessa is a much larger city than Kherson. But the Ukrainian Naval Academy uh, is an institution that my ham uh, family helped establish, and it's very much in Kherson, and we were very well integrated into that uh, region and that city. But as Renata uh, has alluded to, the history of Ukraine uh, is a very painful history of having been conquered, overrun, uh, whether directly, physically, through state intimidation and Galadamor, 
or the Holocaust. Uh, my family has seen it all. And we went from a large Jewish family to a very small one, consisting largely of my grandmother and my great grandmother. Um, and uh, my, mo my mom was born to my grandma. She was an only child. Um, and my mom decided to leave the little town and pursue film school uh, in Moscow. And I have the distinction of being the only one in the family to be born outside of Khipsod. Um, and it is a very strange and personal connection that I think like every immigrant I thought was long forgotten because now I'm a baseball playing uh, tough live in New Yorker kind of thing. Uh, and all of a sudden, all those memories of spending summers on the Dnieper River, learning to fish and swim with my granddad in that river, uh, going to the Black Sea with my grandma, doing the crazy mud baths that Eastern European people do. Uh, all of that came flooding back. And also re-engaging with my childhood friend, uh, uh, Jorik, who's back in Hifson with a 73-year-old mother. And up until yesterday, they were working with javelins and Kalashnikovs to ward off the Russian invasion and made it all too real. But uh, in a strange way, because I straddle, unfortunately, both sides of this or all three sides of this conflict, um, what really makes it personal and real is a small piece of paper like my, that my mom reminded me of, which is my Russian conscription order. Um, one of the many reasons we did not go back uh, is that every 17 year old has to respond to conscription. And she, my mom showed me before coming on and speak to you, all of you, uh, a small slip of paper, no bigger than this on paper quality that is reminiscent of toilet paper, uh, not even the high end stuff that basically orders you to report for duty. And just the thought of having to be ordered by Russia to go back to my ancestral land to point a gun at my grandma. It, it would, would have been a very real action if I were in Russia today. Uh, and so all of the maybes that Renata just talked about also touched a bit of a nerve because the strangest feeling that I have um, as a former undocumented immigrant is just the thought of gratitude for the passing of my grandparents. Um, because I never got to see them. Uh, we left in 93. I didn't get to see my grandma and grandpa again. But the thought that I, if we had stayed, I would have come back in a Russian uniform to point my gun at them would have been unbearable. And at the same time, even sitting in the United States, I don't think I could have logically explained to them what was happening. And they survived Golodomor. They survived Stalinism. They survived the Holocaust this would have been too much. And so this is incredibly personal. Um, and in, in whatever capacity I have, uh, and whoever is listening on this webinar, I, I think it's important uh, to stand with the people of Ukraine at this hour, no matter perfections and perfections, perceptions, that has to take be put on the back burner because the future of democracy is at stake in a very meaningful way for all of us in the Western world. Thank you for bringing us into the, the real ramifications of this. I think that there are times when things that are happening in Europe on the European continent, there is a perception of outside of diasporas that are directly affected. There is a perception that what does this have to do with me? Um, and so I wanna just do a little bit of housekeeping at the moment, mid thought, which is to say, we'll have 20 minutes, 21 minutes of conversation um, amongst all of us. So I don't <laughs> plan on calling on you um, individually, um, but I'd like to have a conversation and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Again, people are already starting to use that, um, but I wanted to just start this portion by saying, how did we get here? I mean, many of us, um, many of us on this call lived through the Cold War, right? Or some aspect of the Cold War. And I think here in the United States, there was this idea that this had finished. Like, why are we talking about nuclear options? What, what, what is happening? And so, if, um, how did we get here? Oh, my turn, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, I was on the phone 
just before with um, Professor Rajmanan, who's a uh, Russia expert, and he, and he is on, on a kind of think tank that deals with Russian matters, and he's been constantly giving interviews to the press. And he said, you know, nobody knows how we got here. On some level, not even the highest experts know exactly how we got here, because I think nobody ultimately anticipated that Putin would go this far. This was, I mean, everybody knew Putin was dangerous. Everybody knew that there were Russian troops at the border of Ukraine, but still I think the common belief was that Putin was rational to an extent. Um, and, and, and at the same time, you know, one of the things, I mean, I can say two things about traveling through the areas that I traveled in. And one of the things that was very clear to me being in Russia was that in the areas that I traveled in, World War II was not over. People were talking about it in present terms. People were talking about borders, people were talking about Stalin. And one of the reasons why it's not over or it was not over is because it was never mourned or memorialized or dealt with. So we modern Germany acknowledged Nazism and we memorialized it. And it's a kind of thing that belongs to the past. And now there is supposedly a new Germany and so on. In Russia, the past is in the present. And so you can go travel 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from the city and just see burial sites of gulag victims that have never been that are unmarked because they've never been acknowledged or recognized and so on and so the feeling when you talk to people people are still talking to you about um the borders and everything seems still unsettled and so when you think about it in in those terms you realize that um for Putin, something like putin who was ultimately a kgb um, agent, um, the war was not over, and the fantasies about reconstituting the former Soviet Union and is did not go away, and we're not we're not we're not we're not, we're not dealt, dealt with or acknowledged. Um, so that's I think that's one one way why why we got there. I mean there are a lot of theories. I mean I think it, you know everybody has become a Ukraine expert, um, and. Um, you know, there are many people who think actually the pandemic had something to do with it, right? With Putin sitting and in 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 and reading in the Kremlin archives and reading old maps and so on. Um, and and there are a lot of analysis, but you know, this was um, very clear to me. Um, one, the level of Soviet nostalgia that was present in um, in the, the areas that um, that I traveled in. Um, alongside with a complete lack of acknowledgement of the past. And therefore, I mean, I'm sh of course I'm shocked like everyone, but on some level, when I think retroactively, I think, okay, the past is just spilled into the present because for us here, we think of the past as the past and something that ended. But for many people, and certainly for Putin and his circles, the past has not ended and this, there's another um, ramification. The second thing is um, a kind of mentality, I think, that is very hard for us to accept today, which is, again, as someone who's written about the gulag, the gulag, as I said, was, the gulag was not a death camp in the sense that the gulags, the Soviet gulag was not something that was invented for the purpose of genocide. Just like I think Putin ultimately doesn't, he's not interested in genocide of the Ukrainian people. He's interested in controlling Ukraine and, um, and having a pro-Soviet government and had the Ukrainians surrendered right away, then there would be no war. It would just be Soviet, another Soviet satellite state. Um, the Gulag was an economic machine that was not meant to kill, but killed anyway. And the reason it killed was because it was inhuman. So you take millions of people, you deport them into some 
godforsaken place and you just drop them there and you tell them you're going to start cutting trees and creating whatever you need to create, building railroads. And if there's not enough food for you and half of you die, okay, never mind. Then we'll replace you with more hundreds of thousands of people. And so that kind of complete disregard for the human element um, in order to achieve a goal, whether a political goal, economic goal, is was there. And I don't think it's, maybe it hasn't really changed as fundamentally as we think it has in, in, in all these years. Um, so that's, you know, these, these would be my answer based on, um, just based on what I observed and, and saw. And, 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 and of course, there are other answers that are circulating out there in, in, in newspapers. Michal, please, I invite you to please put in the chat your, the name of your book um, to remind the audience, because I know that we have people who would love to read your book. Um, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to say, I wasn't, I'm not surprised by what's happening right now. I'm saddened, but I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm not shocked. And I would say, and again, I'm going to use my, my kind of my childhood recollections as a touchstone here. Um, growing up, growing up in a Ukrainian community, um, one of the kind of iconic figures for me was the nationalist Ukrainian immigrant who was rapidly anti-Soviet um, and, and really gave, I mean, and again, I'm going back to the um, late, seven, late 1970s, early to mid 1980s, um, you know, so someone who, you know, kind of, you know, had a militaristic demeanor and was re really ready at that point to pick up arms and fight for Ukrainian independence at any moment. And at that time, I mean, my view of this, and I was a kid, but I was not alone. I mean, it seemed that was a comical figure to me because the idea of a free and independent Ukraine seemed like a chimera, a complete fantasy. There was no way that Ukraine was ever going to be independent. And that goes back to the fact that, you know, it, its whole identity has always been, I took a course in Eastern European history way back when I was an undergraduate, um, but its whole identity has been based on the idea of being like one of the lands in the middle, in the middle with caught between major empires. And in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was really kind of like a football that was passed be between um, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, Poland. Um, I'm going back to Ternopil, which was where my family and my husband's family is from, and Barbara Fishkin. I'm using this as an example because Barbara Fishkin in the Q&A has mentioned um, that she, her mother was born in 1933 in a Ukrainian shtetl near Ternopil. Um, and Ternopil in Western Ukraine, which is a kind of regional city in the vicinity, roughly in the vicinity of Lviv, um, that area of Ukraine was just constantly being passed from one from one controlling entity to another. And, um, and so the prospect of a free Ukraine came as a complete surprise to me when it happens, um, really not to be expected. And I guess I would say I'm not surprised because uh, given that history, for Ukraine to be left vulnerable, neither a member of the EU nor a member of NATO, I'm, I don't find this to be unexpected at all. As I said, I'm saddened by it, but not surprised. Uh, I'm, I'm going to agree with Renata in the strongest possible way. Um, and it reminds me, but as Professor Deckel was discussing it, it reminds me of a, a great saying, a Russian saying, which is, I think, quite appropriate at this time, which is, our future is in our past. And that's the mentality of a whole country of 160 million people, where you know the great future is what we've already done before. And it limits what it is that you can and cannot do or expect to accomplish because there's no one looking forward. Everyone's looking back for what it should be. And it's not that. And that brings me to exactly the same point as Renata. I am not surprised in the very least. And I was nine years old when the whole thing started to unravel or unraveled in 1991. I was nine. And I remember staying up and seeing these things on television as the Baltic states seceded. And uh, every night, the, the Baltic uh, countries would put up a block post to indicate their border. And every night, pro-Russian separatists would set those things on fire. The next morning, the Baltic states would come out again and put up a border saying we're a free country. And again, the pro-Russian separatists would set it on fire. And I would watch this with my mom. 
because uh, there was independent television, there was Glasnos, there was Perestroika, there was the softer Gorbachev communist touch. And my mom said, this is the world is changing and it's going to change in your lifetime. She never allowed for the possibility that by August of that year, right on her birthday, the whole thing would fall apart. And my mom, who was a blacklisted journalist in the Soviet era, because of her interests in the Holocaust and the gulags, and having had the distinction of being shelved by the Gorbachev government for producing a documentary on the gulags and the works of Varlam Shalamov, uh, she believed that the world's going to change. She was not a protester, but she found herself on the streets in front of the Russian parliament in a string of women standing in front of tanks. And I think uh, my only sort of change as to why I expected this, I agree with Renata. Uh, Europe dilly-dallied too much and NATO was indecisive. It's, it's a similar problem that we inherited and have to deal with with Turkey where there are just inconsistencies in whether you attribute them to race, class, uh, Western Europe thinking itself to be superior to a partially Asian country or Eastern Euro Europe. Uh, this is what's getting us into this trouble today. I will say that I do think that this war is genocide in the sense of cultural genocide, because what Putin was banking on is that the Russian-speaking Ukrainians would welcome the Russian-speaking troops the same way that they were welcomed in the Crimea and somewhat welcomed in the Donbas. That simply did not happen because I think Ukrainians, for the first time, uh, tasted freedom and a little bit of self-government. Chaotic, corrupt, all of that is true, but it was still their freedom and their country. And independent of what, where you line up with respect to your allegiance and language and culture, um, uh, they still lined up behind the country first. And I think that level of nationalist identity was something that was grossly miscalculated uh, mis uh, uh, mis uh, on the part of the Russians. Thank you for that. What is the role of the United States? We are all in the United States. President Biden has just presented a, made an ask of US Congress in terms of uh, authorizing billions um, to aid uh, the Ukrainian effort for, um, to reestablish their independence, to beat back uh, Russian troops. Uh, what, on a formal level, we know that um, the United States historically and to this day has little appetite in terms of the US public has little appetite to put to commit troops to such efforts. Uh, you heard President Biden say that we would not, there would not be American troops on the ground. So what should the role of the US government and the role of, of people in the United States, the US public, what, what is happening there? What can we say about that? Um, I just wanted to, to say, if you don't mind, that just to answer uh, uh, Renata and and then Lev and to and me to and to kind of build on what they're saying, um, you know, I was when I was in um, Poland in 2014. I was um, my hosts were um, people, basically Polish na Catholic nationalists who later became the the government. A year later, we became the Polish government and. They would say to me, kind of whispering, they would say, you know, we have these paramilitary training for civilians for the day that Russia invades us. And I would be sitting there thinking, these people are like paranoid, scary people who are using this to justify their own um, nationalism. Um, I mean, I just, and not only did I think that, but historians, especially leftist historians that I was talking to and so on, they were saying, oh, these, they're really using this. I mean, I couldn't imagine truly that this was something that was a real possibility. And I think now when I speak to Polish historians and I've been on Zoom with a few of them in the last few days, they all feel like they will be next on some level. So uh, of course, Poland is a member of NATO and it's more complicated, but still. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing to, to really build on what Lev said is, Yes, we have, a, we have a nation of 160 million people believing that the past is the present, but we have to remember also that it's that belief and that Soviet nostalgia is manufactured to an extent. It's not necessarily um, 
genuine. I mean, a lot of it's also because memorializing is is prohibited, is memory cultural memory is suppressed in an active way. I mean, when I was traveling in those areas, actually, um, I had plain clothes policemen follow me around. Um, I had I was working with a kind of clandestine human rights memory activist person who was basically collecting names of gulag. Um, of people who died in gulags and everything was done completely clandestinely and he was they were so scared and it took me a long time to even have them sort of talk to me and they kept saying no no the archive is closed today come back tomorrow um, and so we have to remember that this is also nostalgia and that worldview is being used as a political tool by um, very cynical people um, and you know, I mean, whether they believe it or if, it, or if it's cynical, but it's being used as a political tool and it still is being used as a political tool now. In terms of the United States, look, I mean, I don't really feel um, an expert on, on that in any way, but I do think from what I'm reading, I was reading Fiona Hill, for example, people who are real experts who say, um, you know, that anything that, you know, any company that diverts, that divests from Russia is, is helpful. I mean, if I mean, completely isolating Russia in any way, an ordinary company that has a branch in Russia, um, definitely, of course, um, freezing assets of Putin's of oligarchs and Putin's all of that will help because they're not, you know, if it's completely isolated economically and politically, Russia will not be able to sustain the occupation of the Ukraine for forever and ever and ever. But of course, um, you know, as Renata said, um, you know, all that progress is going to be, might be all completely destroyed. Um, and they'll, you know, and so it's not, before the occupation, there'll be a lot of destruction, but um, it, it looks like that's where we're heading. I mean, I don't think we're sending troops at this point and maybe it's not, I'm not even sure. And again, I don't feel like I have the enough knowledge to speak here, but I'm not sure, given the fact that that Putin is very serious about um, nuclear weapons, I mean, it, it, is, it, is it really in our interest to, to, to escalate the conflict by sending troops and making this a kind of West versus East conflict? Um, so it's, I mean, there are no easy answers to this, to this question, I think. So like Mahal, I'm also going to say I'm no foreign policy expert, so I'm not going to weigh in on the question of how the United States deals with the nuclear threat of Russia. Um, but rather, I do want to focus on, again, keeping this on the personal level. Um, so I have I have a couple of at least a couple of relatives who are in the army, actually in the in the Ukrainian army fighting right now in Kyiv. Um, and I also have a I've, so I've, been, I've been in touch with with family members over the past week. And I also have a family member who is in um, in a, it's a small Piedvolochisk, it's a smaller town outside of Ternopil, which seems to have become a landmark for us in this conversation. And he's, uh, he's, a, so he has, he's married and has two kids, um, roughly the same, close in age to my own kids. And, um, and he's talked just over the past week, they went from, uh, from everything being kind of fine and you know, town was quiet and they would take shelter in the basement of their apartment building when the sirens would go off um, to now they are really preparing for war. He and his mother, who also lives in the town, are volunteering to support the army. They are making Molotov cocktails. And um, you know, so I kind of check in with him every morning. And this morning he sent me a video showing snow falling on the town from their apartment window and saying that they got some snowfall, but the kids cannot go outside um, to play in the snow. So I, and I, I, this last night I kind of acted on something or looked into something that I had been thinking of for a while. And that was what would it take for me to sponsor bringing my family members, particularly the, the kids of this part of my family um, over to the United States. I, you know, I don't expect that uh, the, the, the dad, my cousin will leave, but certainly his wife and kids. Um, and what I discovered is that the United States at this point still does not have a TPS or temporary or a temporary protective services um, in place for Ukraine. So while we're watching and applauding all of the countries around Ukraine that are taking in refugees, um, the United States does not yet have the bureaucracy in place for us to actually accept refugees in the United States. Um, 
you know, last night the count was over a million refugees had already left the left Ukraine. So I, I certainly think that there are things that the United States can be doing on a humanitarian level um, in order to in order to serve Ukraine's interest and the and the people of Ukraine. Uh, well, I, I guess I'll use the same preface as Renata and Michal on the foreign ex uh, policy expertise here, but uh, I did serve uh, at the UN in a number of capacities, and, uh, and I serve on the Board of Human Rights First, whose entire mission is to hold uh, U.S. policymakers accountable for documentation that we have signed or are uh, parties to treaties to uh, and enforcing those treaties. And in that framework, I think the role of the United States can be multi-layered uh, to the extent that Renata has des described, certainly looking into ways of supporting refugees, bringing over loved ones uh, and calling your member of Congress and telling them to provide uh, temporary protective status for all those who are affected by the crisis. And I should say, that the image of a modern Ukrainian does not square with the image of a Ukrainian that we are used to, because Ukraine is a much more diverse place uh, than it used to be when I was a child, and certainly uh, when Renata's family, when Renata was a child. Uh, and these are changing times, and one of the many accounts that are troubling that we're seeing at the Polish border in particular is that black Ukrainians are not being allowed across the border because they are not seen as Ukrainians because the image does not align. Now, I think directly uh, for the United States and as Dean Valdez knows, I take memos very seriously. And I think in this particular uh, example, the Budapest Memorandum is a very serious document because the Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal for its territorial guarantees from the United States and Russia. We are a signatory to that. And I think we do have, if not a moral, but a legal obligation to do what we can to support the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, that's number one. Number two, to, for all of us, in terms of we have to ask what kind of a world do we want to live in and what is it going to take for us to have that kind of a world? Because frankly, the only person who saw the Nazis for who they were was Winston Churchill. And when he said that a threat to democracy anywhere is a threat to democracy everywhere. And this saber rattling with nuclear weapons and now blatant coordination for this attack between Russia and China is a major threat to the kind of world I want to live in and the kind of world I immigrated to. So honestly, if we care about nuclear non-proliferation, if we care about a safe world, if we want a rules-based order, if we want international governance, international cooperation, and if more immediately we care about stopping a genocide before it grows somewhere else, we will support Ukraine in everything that we possibly do. Uh, and in every action that we can take from personal to corporate to national should be on the table. And we cannot back away from a threat or from a nuclear, just because of a nuclear threat from Russia. And as uh, foreign ministers of France and Great Britain have said, they have them too. None of us want to be at this point. And I want to make it clear, I am afraid of nuclear weapons. I think we all should be afraid of the use of nuclear weapons. But we cannot back away because this is just the tip of the iceberg that could shift the entire trajectory of a rules-based order that we have gotten used to, and it is worth fighting for. Thank you, Lev. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. Thank you, participants, for bringing questions into the Q&A. If, if there are others, please use the Q&A, those of you in our audience. I'm going to start with Barbara's question. Um, because she was the first. Are any panelists able to suggest how can we make sure our donations to Ukraine actually get to people on the ground, to civilian soldiers, to refugees and families who are sheltering among others? Um, I, I have to say that um, part of what I wrote about is uh, refugee aid during World War II, uh, American, mostly American, but also worldwide refugee aid to um, to basically to to refugees, um, Polish refugees, in my case, Jewish and Christian in the Soviet Union. And I would say that of the donations that were sent, maybe 
20% got to the refugees. Um, I mean, there's, we have to assume in any kind of situation like this that there are a lot of levels of corruption, although this is also, it's like we're in a different world. I mean, there are, maybe there are more protections, but I, I think we have to, there are no guarantees. Um, but I do think, I think something gets to people and that we have to, like as Lev said, we have to, we have to do it. Um, in, in even if we know that, you know, it might not, not everything might get to the right, exactly the right people that we want it to get to. The, the only thing I could suggest, and I have friends who've done this, uh, is there is a donation uh, link uh, where you could send a wire transfer to the Ukrainian National Bank with a special designation for troops and or those who remain behind. I One of my friends has done that. I will say what's incredible in terms of corporate collaboration on this, uh, a bank was going to charge her $45 for the wire transfer of $100. And when they asked what is the purpose of this transfer, she said it is for the to support uh, the soldiers of Ukraine. Uh, Chase Bank chose to not charge her the forty-five dollars. So I, I would suggest direct support uh, into the Ukrainian National Bank uh, as the best mechanism for getting that money there. And as Michal pointed out, whoever handles it afterwards, that's going to be on their karma, not mine. And the Ukrainian government is also taking contributions via cryptocurrency right now. And you can do that directly to the Ukrainian government, which I think is also a fairly um, reliable way of getting funds to Ukraine. Thank you all for that. Hunter Moran, uh, Hunter Macaulay, Hunter student. Thank you, Hunter, for, for uh, having this question. How are the Russian people in disagreement with the war in danger? And whether you see to be a safe way to disagree with the Russian government, we've seen protests break out in Russia, right, against this invasion. So, um, anyone, how? What are we seeing? What more do you know about that? Uh, why don't you? I'll jump in. Um, uh, there are reports um, that tonight, the, well, the Russian Duma today has been considering imposing martial law across Russia. Uh, partly it is in response to not quite an outright rebellion, but certainly sizable protests, especially in St. Petersburg that have made international news, but also in the far east of the country. Uh, in Russia, there are really historically two modes of change uh, in government. Uh, one is what has been dubbed uh, the Julius Caesar solution, uh, and we are in March, so that could happen. Uh, the second option is it starts in the Far East and spreads westwardly towards Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, both are possible, but there is no safe way to protest in Russia. And at the same time, just the fact that journalists, state journalists are resigning, the fact that national television stations are being turned off, the fact that they're debating martial law behind closed doors and the possibility of it being implemented tonight all means that the government and the ruling party are very worried about being toppled. And I think all of those are positive developments because in, in a way we have to think about what comes after this. It's the same question that reformers like my mother th thought and fought for from 91 to 93 what is the question of how do you build civil society in a closed society? How do you create a safe environment for the opposition that will buffer against such incredible action uh, in the future? That is what we need to be focusing on as well, because frankly, hopefully, with the support both of everyday citizens, corporations, and governments, this regime will be starved of cash, will be starved of popular support, and it will collapse, and it will be on us to once again to reach out a hand of friendship, whether it's bush legs, which was sort of made me aware of what America was in the 90s when we were starving, or whatever it is in the future, whether it's Biden oats, I don't care. We need to reach out once again with a hand of friendship to those who are in Russia and are willing to build a new society that has the safeguards that a democratic society needs, namely a viable opposition.
Renata, before I, I turn, I want to make sure. Did you have anything to add? <laughs> no, no, I defer to Liv on that. <laughs> Professor Gutfruns from, from Hunter College. How does this invasion impact internal politics in Russia? Do, quote, ordinary Russians see this as a step backwards? Or are they in support of, of Putin's aggression? I think it's both ends here, right? <laughs> like, I think, like, you have supporters and then you have... You, and just from what we are hearing again and, and the, the steps that are being taken, again, it is a striking thing. Uh, I think uh, Rachel Maddow came back to her MSNBC uh, show the night of the invasion and was very clear on showing images of Russians in the streets, right? To let a US audience know and let a global audience know, right? That this, that this, this dissension is happening. Right, that there is, we know that there is a, on a certain level, there for certain segments of the Russian population, there is a disconnect between what the government is doing in the name of the nation and what the nation is actually in support of. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's certain, there's, I mean, yes, I mean, I think there's certainly both. Um, I mean, my, when, again, when I was traveling in these areas, my sense was to the, the extent this was a generational. There was a generational divide and it, the, certainly the young people were a lot more open to the West and a lot more critical, although everybody, again, everybody was very careful. Um, but, um, you know, on the other hand, I mean, I, I interviewed a few people who were former exiles in gulags and some of them would say, you know, no, I was just building the country and you know it was my you know there was sort of in a way there was completely justifying it and you know because I'm, this is a great country um and so um yeah there's probably both but it, yes it certainly appears as Lev said I mean certainly appears that there's there's a lot of confusion um and a lot of people just don't, a lot don't know what's going on and there certainly seems to be a lot of resistance and that resistance to to Putin's government of course has been building up even before this conflict and it was there and it was suppressed. I mean, um, the, the problem is that it's, um, I guess, you know, how much damage will Putin do on, even if it's on his last leg, if, if, it, if it is his last leg. Um, and that's really, I mean, his, I, as I understand it, his Putin's only rival, viable rival in Avlani, of course, is, is an appeal, penal colony. So, um, it's not really clear how this is going to play out, but there is, I mean, I want to be with Lev and to, to think that maybe this could be the, at the end of this destruction, there could be an optimistic outcome. Uh, I'm going to just uh, jump in for a second because every couple of days I watch Russian state media and the one thing we don't fully appreciate in this country and because this is a bygone era, the power of television, it's long gone here. We're all on, the kids are on TikTok. I'm still on Facebook. We used to get our news from The Daily Show. But there it's Channel One News and it hasn't changed. And I have to say, I was watching it largely out of nostalgia because the music even is the same and the way they deliver the news is the same. And then they randomly get cast opinions in their pieces. And but 80% of Russians get their information from Channel One News. And it is a generational divide. Uh, old folks, you know, like my grandma wouldn't know what Europe looked like. And when she would fight with my mom about whether or not to immigrate, her only experience abroad was a concentration camp. Uh, that's the bottom line. And the old folks are behind Putin. They believe the propaganda that there is no war, there is no conflict. And when the BBC interviews them, they say, well, there is no war. Putin said there'll be no war, and he's a man of his word. Uh, but the young folks know what's going on. They're the ones who are being conscripted. They're the ones who are at risk of being sent to the front lines. They're the ones who are on the line. And by the way, they're also the ones who have now been to France and London and want to go to Capri again, want to come to America. They may be proud Russians, but they're not anti-West, and they sure as hell don't want to die. Uh, so... Uh, that's why you see this generational divide, not just because they're plugged in, uh, but certainly because they've seen the world and they want to be a part of it. And I think it's this constant tug in Russian history between turning inwards and eastwards 
or opening a window to the West. And it goes in cycles. And that's why, you know, I'm optimistic about two things. Uh, as a former uh, Macaulay professor, David Petraeus is on TV now every day uh, saying, look, uh, the Russians are going to lose this. They're not going to be able to bring Ukraine back into the fold of the Russian Empire. Uh, they're not going to succeed, whether it's by the end of this week or in 30 years. Uh, it's the Russia will not hold on to Ukraine, number one. Number two, young people don't want to live in an isolated Russia. Uh, the real question is how much are they willing to pay and how much have they paid already uh, for being there now? And lastly, um, again, this is the kind of civil society we need to worry about in the aftermath. So that free value, the va value of free speech uh, has to be there. And it brings me back to my mom who 1989 was interviewed by CBC in our communal apartment kitchen. And she said, I want to be free, not just for me, but for all Russian people to be free. They didn't take and embrace freedom in, after the collapse. I hope after this, they will embrace freedom for everything that it offers. Thank you, Lev. We're coming up on the six o'clock hour, so I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So I'm going to ask for short responses to these last two questions um, as short as possible um, and give me a minute to close out this event. Um, so one was um, from Michelle Israelova to you, Lev, regarding the memo of disarmament of nuclear weapons. Um, are there no repercussions um, for betraying a promise that we as the United States were signatories to. And then to all of you, what, what does this panel think about the West media coverage of the invasion? So let me just quickly respond. It was a memorandum, not a congressionally approved formal treaty. The only protectorate treaty that we do have that is a treaty is with Taiwan, which would be a whole other hour for us to discuss. On Western media coverage, I think has been phenomenal. And I just want to say on record and recorded record that I think uh, President Biden and Secretary Blinken have done a phenomenal job of shepherding the West to this moment of unity when we needed it most. Um, sorry, Renata, go ahead. No, go ahead, Michelle. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, it, one more word about the generational gap, because, you know, one of the, one of the theories is that this is also about, uh, it is a, um, this is a war over, over the chain between generations. I mean, some people are really framing it in that way. And, you know, we, it's very well known that Putin is one of his huge phobias is sort of woke, woke culture, um, multiculturalism. Um, transgender rights, gay rights, and so on. And you would think like, why is he so phobic of that? But for Putin, for many, for Putin, um, I think there is a sense that the young generation has been hijacked um, from the old generation. And in some ways, of course, the Ukraine and, and its freedom represent that. So um, that's, a, that's a part of that too. And so I'm just going to jump in and say that uh, with regard to media coverage, um, we are a, my, uh, my home is a CNN household, right? So we've been, and we've been, ha we've ha had CNN in the background um, for the, you know, the last eight days, um, every morning, every evening into the night. Um, but as, as kind of a, a, a thought experiment, we've um, also dipped in to see what Fox News is up to because we were curious about how this is being covered. And I was really surprised to see that although the tone is a bit, you know, the, kind of the way things are packaged is different on Fox News than it is on CNN. Um, and there are differences in who, which American politician is blamed for the situation we find ourselves in. But there really is no difference in the amount of sympathy that is being expressed for Ukraine and the amount of um, hostility that's being expressed toward Russia. Uh, so I think it's interesting that despite the fragmentation of media perspectives in the United States over the last, you know, the, how you, one would generally think that CNN and Fox News are going to are going to have very different messages. I think it's interesting to see how much unity there is in media coverage and in public opinion about Ukraine. And I will say that I think one of the sources of that may have to do with Ukraine's leadership right now, um, and what a, I mean. You know, 
Lev mentioned um, mentioned Biden, but I'm going to jump in and say, you know, I think, you know, the, I'm not not alone in voicing um, how extraordinary I think uh, Zelensky has been through this, and how he's also been he's you know extraordinary in unifying his people and being there with them, um, but also extraordinary in the uh, in his interactions with um, with the with other countries, other world leaders, um, and in the face that he has put on this struggle for the international community. Thank you all. I did wanna thank, sorry, love, cause you unmuted and I have to, and we have to wrap this up. Um, but I wanted to thank Drs. Deco, Miller and Svididov for this evening. I will say this is the first panel that we will be having about this crisis. Um, I am already in collaboration with Professor Zora Said of Macaulay Honors College, we are planning a second panel specifically regarding the refugee crisis um, and what we can do, um, what the ramifications are for, for the European continent, for NATO countries, for the United States as well. Um, you know, you brought up, you mentioned uh, the lack of, of temporary protective status, Renata, that has been happening. So what, the, what that future looks like. Um, I wanna thank our audience this evening. Again, this is a recorded event. So you, for, you will be able to see this on the Macaulay Honors College YouTube page in the near future. And we ask that you please share this. This was a very vibrant conversation. Again, I thank all of you for, for participating. Charmaine, if you come back for a second, um, if you wanna say any final words for us. I just want to say what it's, you know, watching this every night on TV and seeing, you know, heartbreaks and just seeing Love mentioned that, you know, we're honors college and we are seeing students who study abroad and study there and um, trying to get back to their home base. So um, just, you know, my heart goes out to everyone that's involved in this. And thank you for having this conversation. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. We wish you peace. Uh, I'll just say one more thing, which is Slava Ukraini. <laughs> Thank you, Nev. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Take good care. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you.